he's a defender of the weak and uh, and a and a, and a pro prosecutor of of the evil, and he that's what he does. And he's uh, he's an English lord. So James Bond, he's not. <laughs> if anybody's if anybody's expecting another James Bond, Hawk is the direct opposite of James Bond. He has a great life. He has a lot of fun. Um, he has a lot of toys. He's the sixth richest man in England. And uh, yeah, it's, he's he's what I want to be when I grow up. So, uh, uh, me too. Uh, <laughs> and, and included the the sixth richest man in England part, by the way. <laughs> right, right. Um, but in in the uh, in the book just prior to this, uh, he was sent um, to uh, try to break up this this thing called the Red Star Alliance, which is uh, something put together by cast by the the, Ca the third Castro brother that nobody's ever heard of, and um, and he's now come to power in Havana, and he is putting together a conference in Havana for all the communists and socialist governments. <laughs> Uh, in the world to try to forge an alliance of communist and socialist governments. And Hawk, his task uh, in Dragonfire, which is the one just preceding this, is to find those guys and wipe them out, just take them down. And there is a Chinese crime syndicate called the Tang, Tang Dynasty. Uh, and it's run by two twin brothers, Tommy and uh, uh, Tommy Tang and, and, uh, and, uh, and Bobby. And they are uh, just like, to sort of evil guys, and they run this criminal enterprise, and um, and so that's what that's what he does in that in that first book, and he's um, it's, it's tough, and he's, he's he's sort of badly wounded at one point, and uh, um, so in at the end of that book, he decides that he really needs to pull back from this life that he's been living, which is uh, really expecting that he might never come home every time he goes out uh, on a mission. And he's also got a, a wonderful 10-year-old uh, son named Alexi uh, that was his child with uh, this woman that he married who's a, uh, a Russian countess. Um, and um, so she's got him and he never sees the boy. So he goes to the head of MI6, a guy named Sir David Trulove and says, I'm gonna need some time off. I gotta stop doing this for a while. And I've had this, this major, uh, uh, ocean going yacht built up in Holland uh, and it's uh, it looks like a yacht but it's actually a battleship it's mm -hmm. armored it's got you know radar detection it's got SAM missiles it's got all kinds of stuff so he's ready to like take on anybody um, and so then Seahawk is the voyage of the Seahawk around the world Hawk taking out terrorists coming close together with his son, finding you know, the bond between them that never existed, teaching his son about how the world really works, you know, how to shoot a shotgun, how to hit a seven iron, uh, how to know what to look for in a woman, how to know what to look out for in a woman, how to, uh, you know, just the, the rules of the road for being a guy. And so that's a, that, that relationship between the two of them is very important. And this kid, Putin's art, I mean, Alex's arch enemy has always been Putin. Mm -hmm. Putin has had his son kidnapped and almost killed. Um, they took him off of a ski lift in Samaritz in Switzerland and, and, and held on to him for ransom. And the ransom was Hawk had to stop doing what he was doing and to leave Putin alone. And, uh, but Hawk, Hawk saved, saved Alexei in the end. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of an old fashioned <clears throat> ski adventure. Um, Somebody was laughing the other day. They said, Ted, you've got sword fighting in the end of this book? I said, yeah. He said, really? Sword fighting in a 21st century thriller? I said, yeah, why not? So I have this huge Errol Flynn type battle between Hawk on his boat and the bad guys on their boat. And they're like, they're sword fighting. They're swinging down on lines and, and he's acting like Errol Flynn and uh, I don't know. I just had so much fun. I can't tell you writing this book. It's like, and it's it's a great read, by the way. I mean, it's so good. Um, the the yacht that you mentioned that's more like a, a battle tank on water. But that sounds like overkill. The irony there is, uh, it was the last vacation, coincidentally in overkill. 
your your tenth hawk book where little Lexi was taken from the Swiss Alps. So like vacations never go well for the Hawk family, which is why I was nervous when, when I remember we talked way back and I remember you said they're going to go on vacation. I thought, Oh, here we go. Uh, something bad's going to happen to, to Lord Alex this time and yeah. his son again. But I love that you incorporate the, the father son themes. Was that planned for you, by the way, did, is that something that you wanted to do or did that just come about while you were writing this? I, I just emotionally, I, I, I felt like it would, it would bring something in Hawk. It wasn't, visible before or there to the fore mm -hmm. and show him as that side of him as a human being his love for his son and his um his wisdom about life and things like that and i just thought it was time for him to to do that so i think so i think so too i love seeing more of them uh i like getting to see hawk as as a father in the middle by the way of all the action i mean that yeah. doesn't go anywhere he's still uh you still got to be out there and, and doing his thing and trying to save the world and whatnot. You, you mentioned the Tangs. My favorite Tang is Tiger Tang. Um, Tiger Tang. Yeah. Tiger Tang. And, and you and I have talked about him a lot. Um, did Tommy, you know when Tiger Tang, the twins? Yeah. Yeah. When, when you created uh, the Tang family for the last book, did, did you know that they were going to be around for more than one book? Was that a plan? Yeah, as, as it kept going, I thought, you know, these guys, they're perfect. I mean, to, to me, uh, the Tang Dynasty is the absolute co-equal of Smirsh. Mm -hmm. Always bonds them in every book, no matter who he was fighting. Smirsh was, you know, that the, the kill all spies, and Smirsh in Russian, it's Smirsh Bionum or something like that. And so this is his Smirsh, his, his, mm -hmm. his Smirsh villain. And they'll be around because um, that's they're, done, they're not going away. It's, it's interesting. As a fan, I can't decide if I wanted to stay around forever or for Hawk to finally kill him, but uh, I, I think, I think well, they're great. Well, it's a worldwide network. It's not just a couple of guys. I mean, it's, you know, that Smirsh is, is, has got assassins and everything all over the world, the Russian, the Russian mm -hmm. by network. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if I get tired of them, I'll go do something. <laughs> uh, it's great to see you in a bookstore, by the way. This couldn't have happened last year. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she, where no, and she actually looks like she's at the helm. She's standing, looks like she's the captain of her ship and all who sail her. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm well, sorry. This, no, this this couldn't happen last year. So you know, it's really great to see because of COVID, everything was virtual, a hundred percent. So it's great to see you in the bookstore. I couldn't where, help but notice that COVID is, what, is not. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is what it's all about. Yeah, you know, absolutely. This is it. Yeah. You know, I hope more people realize that. Uh, that um, Got to support independent bookstores. I think all, all all feels right in the world when you know we see big books being launched in in independent bookstores again. It's a good feeling for everybody, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's great to see you there. But I I couldn't help but notice you know reading this one, you uh, different than a lot of authors by the way in the genre. You haven't made COVID like an everyday theme of the book where Hawk's running around with a mask on and they're talking about, you know, getting booster shots and all that. So a lot of authors have, and I just, I just wondered your take on, on why you didn't. My take on it is I'm hey, thrilled well, that you didn't. I can tell you why. I am sick to death of COVID. Yeah. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to see masks. The last thing I want to put in my book is anything to do with that pandemic. Anything. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like there was that period when everybody was writing, all the spy thriller guys were writing um, uh, desert sand, mm -hmm. everything in the desert, you know, camels and, and you know Arab guys on horseback and all that. And that's when I said I, I've had enough. I don't like sand. I like grass and water. So I said I don't. I, I'm not sick of reading these books that take place in the desert. And that's when I moved to Putin and moved to Russia. You know, and I was I think I was the only one that was doing it at that point. Yeah, not when everyone else was. I've always, I've always appreciated about you. Well, I mean, it's my job as a book spy. I have to review everybody, and everyone's following the same trends. And you you always go against the grain, and I love that about you because I can literally look back at at like certain years of my life reviewing thrillers, and it's like that was the year of North Korea. That was the year where everyone had the same ISIS story or the same Russia story, and you've always gone different. ISIS story. Uh, and I love that. I love that about you. Um, and la last question on COVID, because I'm tired of it too. I love that you didn't go there. 
Uh, I deal with COVID like everybody else in the real world. We read these books for an escape because they're fun. Yeah. We want to be entertained. Get away from COVID. Absolutely. But so, so that said, you, how are you a lot of thriller writers using COVID in their books? Yeah. Really? Yeah. They're, a lot of them. It's pretty mixed, but yeah. Into the plot. Well, at the very least reference, you know, it's brought up a lot in the books themselves or, you know, how, how characters travel or, you know, a lot of, there are writers that have their characters and more power to them, uh, you know, wearing masks and stuff like that. But, and I get that that's rooted in reality and that's totally fine. But uh, like you, I'm sick to death of it. And yeah. it's nice to go into this and, and sort of just have an escape. Yeah. A break. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that has always fascinated me uh, about you and your writing style is you're not really an outliner. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. I not think we shot something on. Not even yeah. slightly. An outliner. You're not at all. I know. I'm an inline. I, I know. I, so, some of my favorite stories uh, being friends, I've had the privilege to hear. I always tell people that when you call me and you read little, little passages, I get to hear the real hawk read the fake hawk. And that's my favorite thing to do. And I, and I always say to you, and this is always the, the funniest part. I go, Ted, what happens next? And you go, I don't know. <laughs> that's what you always say. I don't know. I got to figure it out. So what is your writing process like? Because you don't outline at all, like, like a lot of authors do. So how, how do you not outline and continue to just bang out New York Times bestselling novels? Yeah. I told you that story about Patterson, right? When he was yeah. helping me with Hawk. And he, uh, he would... I, You'd go because we live three houses from each other in Florida, and so I go over there and give him the manuscript, and he'd read and say, "Okay, I'll call you later." So he called me. I said, "What are you doing with this book?" I said, "What do you mean, Jim?" He said, "You go down all these roads. You know, every time I think I know where you're going, you go, oh, you're on another road. Then you go on another. You got to start outlining." I said, "I'm not going to outline." So here I am telling the world's best-selling author that I'm not going to follow his advice. Um, but I just I never could do it. I never could work that way. It wouldn't be fun. You know, sit there and have a, a yellow pad and say, okay, Alex goes to the grocery store. Okay, Alexi breaks his leg in a, in a softball game. I mean, what? No, I'm not doing it. Um, yeah, yeah. It takes the fun out of it, right? It's not fun for me. It's not fun yeah. for the reader. Well, I think that that goes back to the old adage of, you know, if you have fun writing it, we'll have fun reading it. That's and true. That is true, actually. Yeah, and you've rubbed off on me uh, because uh, as I enter those author waters myself, I'm supposed to be outlining my next book, and I'm over here like I can't do it. Uh, it does take all the fun yeah. out of it. You do all outline that you have to outline. Uh, well, you know that's a funny that's so it's funny funny that you ask because technically I am an outliner, but only because I had a payment tied to it. So you bet I submitted an outline to get paid. That was it. And well, then as I, I started I writing you. the book, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you. Yeah, yeah. As I but as I wrote it, I realized. I, I, I hope that they're okay with the fact that this strays pretty far from the outline that uh, they accepted and paid me for. You're writing. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing this Ted Bell style. So we're gonna see if that works out. But no, you know, I, I think- they probably, they probably will read, I probably won't notice it. I mean, they, by the time they read the actual book, I think the outline is like in the-, in the That's distance. what I'm hoping too. That's what I, as long as my publisher doesn't watch this and, and they read a bunch of other stuff in between, I'm golden. <laughs> Brian never, never Brian never yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh the outline. but the thing is so so because you don't outline do you ever have to go back and do a lot of you know reworking and tweaking or do you really just you can just sit and and sort of Vince Flynn style bang these things out and get to the end and you're satisfied with it yeah that's true I don't I, don't, I only write one draft and I and yeah. I, I do I do it as I'm writing out if I see something I'll just kind of do it while I'm going mm -hmm. but I don't go back and read the whole thing and then start over. I just, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Is that what Vince did too? A little bit, yeah, yeah. He always said that, you know, if I don't know where it's going uh, when I'm writing it, the reader will never know. And, um, yeah. you know, and then he'd have the deadline looming and uh, he would just yeah, get I writing. He, I think he had a houseboat or something up in Wisconsin and he would go up there and just lock himself away. Lock himself away and go on the pontoon every day and, and work. Um, I'm not as cool as you guys. So I just, I just sit here and hope to figure it out, but it, but it, it fascinates me that your brain works that way. I'm, I'm super jealous of it, but I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. I don't even know how my brain. I mean, I really don't. I, somebody was telling me about, I think I talked to you about this. 
but that people say, yeah, yeah, dialogue must be really hard because how do you know what people are gonna say or how do they talk or how's one person sound different than the other on the page? But, and, and I think I told you how it works for me is, yeah, I'm writing the, you know, setting up a passage and there's gonna be dialogue for half a page or a page, whatever. I don't write it, I listen to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like basically sitting there and I'm seeing the two or three guys or whoever's talking and I'm just listening to them talk and I'm writing down what they're saying. And I'm like, I like that. That was funny. That was good. Okay. And then this guy said, that was good. And I'm, I'm just listening to him talk. I swear to God. No, talking. I know we, you and I last year, we shot something for um, international thriller writers about writing process. And I remember when you said that I got done shooting with you and I was like, my brain's broken because this is not how it works for me. Uh, why are my characters not just talking so I can just write it down like like Ted's do? But it's the closest thing. I, I think we called it at the time. It was like um, instead of method acting, it's like method writing where method. it's also real and you're able to just kind of capture that. And I think that that's awesome, man. And it always comes out so well. And I mean, you do one draft. That's why every author, uh, you know, hates you because it's not fair that uh, <laughs> you can do that. No. Uh, no, no, we love you, but we're super yeah. jealous that you can do that. <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, look, we've all wanted to see this and you've been close. I know we've been close to Hawk on the big screen. So are there any updates, but more importantly, and you and I have talked about this a lot, who would be your number one choice to play Alex Hawk? Well, an interesting story would be the process of getting to today in terms of who's going to play Alex Hawk. Mm -hmm. Should I tell that story? Yeah. Okay. So this producer friend of mine in Hollywood called me when she saw Hawk on the times list. And she said, you know, I've got a client who's interested in your project and he'd like you to come out here to LA and talk to you. And I said, great. That's exciting. That's really terrific. Who is it? She said, Tom Cruise. Okay. <laughs> it would not have been my first choice but anyway i went i mean how am i gonna say no right yeah and so i went out there and uh, i met with them and, and his his paula wagner his partner and um it just it didn't happen i just didn't want i didn't i was i want to keep my powder dry because i knew there were guys out there that i would really like you know and so literally <laughs> a week after the talks with Tom broke off, I get Johnny Depp. I get a, you know, from Mary, Mary Alice, is that Johnny Depp wants to talk to you. So I go talk to Johnny. I actually go talk to his sister because Johnny was in France. And, uh, and she said, Johnny loves this character. He really wants to do it. And I said, fine. You know, I think he's probably the greatest living actor right now. I, mm -hmm. Physically, he's not, would not be, because Hawk is a very physical a lot of physicality and, and John and Johnny I said my problem is I'll be honest with you I don't want to see Johnny take the shirt off <laughs> <laughs> she didn't appreciate that but that's what I said so anyway so that kind of didn't go anywhere and I said how did Johnny I don't see Johnny walking through concourse a at O'Hare and say hey look, I think I'll buy that read it on the flight to Paris how in the hell did he ever discover Hawk and she said his brother is a screenwriter and he read all the Hawk books and loved him and sent him to Johnny in France and he read it. So he loves him. But that didn't work out. I think Johnny was going, starting to go through a real bad period in his life right there. Mm -hmm. And then Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Which I don't think, I think that's an interesting choice. I would, I know I was all for Hugh Jackman. I mean, yeah. now he's too old, but at the time I thought he'd be great because he's tall and he's, you know, physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But his, he and his business partner broke up and it just tried. I mean, every deal in Hollywood is just like smoke and mirrors, you know? So I'm, I'm talking now to, to um, that same producer who is now connected at the highest levels around town. Mm -hmm. and she has some people that love Hawk and she has some people that love uh, The Time Pirate, which is my young adult uh, time travel thriller. Uh, for streaming. <clears throat> so we'll see. I'll believe it when I'm sitting in the theater going, oh yeah, that's my book. Well, who, who if they came to you and said, Ted, what I'm actor just, do you want? Who would you what, love to tonight, see? Today, tonight? The guy, yeah, I, right I, now. I'm Hardy. Without question. I'm Hardy. I'm Hardy. He's the guy. 
you stuff. know who I like. We've talked about this. I think Hardy's a good one, but to me, uh, he'd have to dye his hair, but it's always been Hemsworth. Kenny Herman was your first choice. I remember that. I, I like Hemsworth. I like Chris Hemsworth for this. Oh, Kenny Herman. Oh, yeah, definitely. Was your first choice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. He said, get Pee Wee. He's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, he could grow with the role. Uh, <laughs> he could grow with anything. He needs to <laughs> he could grow in, He could grow with that role, I'm just saying. Grow into it. But he's had to spend a lot of time in the gym. A lot of uh, time. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, my guy's already in the gym. Hemsworth. I mean, he's ripped. He's ready to go, Ted. That's always been my oh, choice. I'm all over Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, I think he's fabulous. His agent sits right next to my agent. And I, I'd be thrilled to get Chris. I think Chris would be fabulous. Did you see Speed, the Ron Howard Formula One movie? Yeah. I mean, his his English, his his posh British accent is flawless. And yeah. He's, just, he's I think he's I think he's a really nice guy. I think he's really smart. I'd, I'd love him. So there was um, at one time, I don't know if we can say his name, so I won't, but there was a guy, another actor from the Marvel universe oh, who, who had kind of circled this that I thought by far would have been the most intriguing Hawk uh, because the character that he played in Marvel really embodied one side of Hawk, right? So uh Again, I won't say just in case we're not allowed to, but I think you know who I'm talking about. And uh, But there's so many good choices out there that I don't know how this hasn't been made into a movie yet. Yeah, well, I, a lot of people say that. Yeah. You know who really wanted a, a long time ago when he, was, when he was a lot younger? It was Robert Downey Jr. Well, that's what I was talking about. That's what I was alluding to. Well, Iron Man. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if we can say his name. Talking about it. But I yeah. think... I think he would have been fabulous as well. That's what I was talking about. Uh, the, the side of him that Tony Stark is the billionaire. That's it's that's, great. and then and then he played Sherlock Holmes, and yeah, that's okay. when I saw it. We were talking about I saw Sherlock Holmes way back, and I yeah. saw that. I remember I I called or, or you called me, and I said, "Oh, he's it, Dad. You got to yeah, get I, him." I, agree with you. I said, "Yeah, I'd love him. I've always loved that guy. Spider Man just drove me crazy. How good it was." Yeah. How well, good he, yeah. fingers crossed that uh, that we see that one day, and hopefully soon. And let us know if there's an update. Um, Elbowing you and knocking your popcorn out of your, out of your hand. <laughs> and you're going, yes. And the Best Picture Award goes to Ryan Stack, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'll be there. I'll, I'll be there. Let's go. Uh, Ian Fleming, I know, was uh, very inspirational for you, one of your favorite authors growing up. Uh, Hawk is not Bond. I think I, I've called him this generation's Bond and Bond on steroids or Red Bull. Uh, right. But I know that I know Bond was, you know, an important character uh, to you. How then did you discover 007? Uh, I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. and I was spending the summer with my grandmother on the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico in a little town. And I just found this book in a bookstore and it was uh, Casino Royale was the first uh, Hawk book. I mean, the first Bond book. And I read it and I just went, I just went insane over it. I think I read it five times. And then I just went out and got every one. That summer, I read every single book, every Hawk, every Bond book that came out. And I just said, this is the world for me. I want to be in this world. I don't want to be in some sleepy little town down south, you know, <laughs> putting playing cards in the wheel of my bicycle. Make it sound like a motorcycle <laughs> would be my biggest thrill in those days. But anyway, yeah, that was it. Summer I was 13. I remember I one time seven years ago, maybe we talked and I asked you, what drew you in? And you said uh the three B's, bullets, babes, and bad guys. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> right. No, I've I never forgotten. That. Yeah, I loved it. I said, Yeah, this is this is cool. What what is your favorite uh James Bond book? Uh, to, uh, from Russia with Love. Okay. What about your favorite movie? From Russia with Love. Really? How come? I just think they're both great. I okay. Mean, love story. Uh, I thought, um, and by the way, that was from Russia with Love was the last movie Ian saw. He was actually on the set um, during the film. I don't think he, I don't think he saw the finished film, but he was, he was still alive then. And when they, he was at the when they were shooting, he saw it, and then. Uh, he went down to his golf club, played golf in the rain, and got pneumonia and passed away. So, we'll not see his like again. Yeah. Uh, what about favorite James Bond actor? John Connery. 
Daniel I, Craig number two? I kind of think so. I mean, yeah. You know, as we were, it's funny we were talking about this at dinner that night. Everybody was saying their opinion who the best guy was or who they liked the most. <laughs> and you know, I yeah, I think I think Daniel Craig has done a real. I'm sorry to see him go. I think he did a really good job. It was a tough job to step into. And I remember seeing Casino Royale is the first one he did, right? Yeah. And I thought he was great. I did too. So yeah, he did a fantastic job. He and brought I, the uh, the physicality to the role. The tough, the toughness. Yep. Yeah, the mental and physical toughness. And I thought Pierce Brosnan did a good job. I mean, everybody thinks he's like too much of a pretty boy, but I think he was good. You know? I know, I agree. I mean, if he was around in the right age right now, I'd go for him for a hawk. What about um, other authors or, or, or characters that were uh, big, big to you, either growing up or even in your adult life? What other authors were you you fans of? As, as just growing up in general? Yeah, anytime, anytime. Well, my favorite author was then and still is and always will be is uh, Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. And then um, Evelyn Waugh. Um, Thomas Hardy. Yeah. Um, I was always more of a literary guy than a, you know, spy guy or action guy. I was an English major and I, you know, that's my love of my life was literature. So I kind of gravitated towards those guys. Which makes sense. I mean, I know in, in, uh, in the intro they just did for you, um, they said that you're one of the world's best storytellers. And I would add one of the world's best wordsmiths. Uh, in fact, I have said numerous times publicly that if you wrote anything but thrillers, you'd go down as, as the greatest wordsmith of our generation because oh. of the sheer writing talent. But thrillers are in that weird space of uh, it's kind of like when you go to the Oscars and it's like having an action movie. You're never going to win anything for that uh, because, because the artsy people don't, you know, don't fancy that. Uh, I think that's what our genre is a little bit. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah it, they it, do it, well. They dominate the New York Times list. And in movies, I mean, come on. I, every year at the Oscars, I've never seen any of the movies that win, but I saw the latest Fast and Furious movie like eight times in theaters with my kids, right? So I don't know. It's No, but it's kind of like the rap that Stephen King was getting when he was kind of first starting. You know, oh, he's a horror writer. Can't take him seriously. But yeah. Great. And people would make fun of me in the early days of The Shining and The Stand and all those books. I love those books. And I was out in Hollywood a lot shooting and I I carry those books around. If you say, why do you read that stuff? I said, are you kidding me? Have you read any of this guy's books? And they said, no, it's just like his horror stuff, right? I said, this guy is the next American Dickens, pal. And you don't know it. Um, and I think I was right. Yeah. Uh, well, coming back to, to your books, a um, couple quick ones for you. What comes first, the story idea or the title? Story idea. Story idea. Then you have so many great titles. How do you come up with a title? And how do you know when you have a great one? Because I laugh. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will divulge the working title for the next Hawk book as we speak. Yeah. Probably foolish. Tom Colgan will probably shoot me. Is it a bad idea for me to do it? No, we just won't tell Tom. No, yeah, we won't tell. He'll never see this. Lauren will, Lauren will see it. Lauren will tell. Lauren will forget. Don't worry about it. So warmongers. Yeah. Not bad. No, I know. I, I loved it from the moment you told me. Every year you do this thing where you call me, you go, I think I got the title for the next one. And then every year I'm like, how does he do that? Uh, you always have a great title. And, I, and I've always wondered what comes first for you, the title or the story, because they always go so hand in hand. Right, right. I you know what I, I mean? Like a lot of authors have titles that they sound cool, but they have nothing to do with their book. Right. And yours are always, you, you can really tell, get a sense of what that book is right. based on the title. Well, like, like, the one I, I thought I was really happy when I thought of it was, you know, when Putin decides, no, this was my homage to Goldfinger, right? That was how I saw this book. Is it, what is, that looks like a, a shotgun or something. What are you drinking out of? What is oh, just a water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were killing yourself. No. <laughs> nope. Good. Uh, so <laughs> I really spiced up this event, but no. <laughs> anyway, so I um, 
So I had this idea that I wanted to write my my Goldfinger, right? Because that's one of my favorites. <laughs> just, the movie was amazing. I almost like Goldfinger better than From Russia with Love. But I I love Goldfinger. But so I said, I'm going to do a Goldfinger, but I'm going to ratchet it up. So instead of like going to some little town in Alabama and knocking over Fort Knox and stealing some gold, I'm going to have Putin invade Switzerland and steal all the gold in Switzerland, all the world's gold, steal all. Of <laughs> and, and then the Hawks got to like get it back or stop him or something. And that, to me, Russia invading Switzerland, if that's not overkill, I don't know what is. Well, but that's what I mean, though. Your titles are so good, and you can generally get a sense of, you know, what the book is going to be about based yeah. on your title and the cover. They always do great jobs with your covers. But, I mean, Warriors, Phantom, Warlord, Spy, Pirate, Assassin, Hawk, you know. Those are some good ones. Which was the one with the, life, the orange life preserver on the Pirate. Fire. I love that. That was Emily's idea, by the way. Yeah, I'll give her credit for that, Simon Schuster. Um, listen, I know we're gonna take questions in just a second, so so let me let me wrap with this. Um, but Seahawk again, it looks great. Uh, one of my favorites in the series. You did a wonderful job again, Ted. I love this book. What can you tell us, if anything, about what's next for you and what's next for Alex Hawk? God knows what's next for Alex Hawk. That would be <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, doing, I'm not going to sit here and start outlining Alex's life. Uh, next for me, it is just to keep going. You know, yeah. I'm, I love doing this. So you know, I'm just going to, I'm starting to think about what the next book is going to be. And I've got an idea that I'm having a hard time deciding if I should sell it in Hollywood as an original screenplay or sell it as a book. I mean, that, that's how big this idea is. And I'm not kidding. I'll tell you about it sometime. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I'm, crazily excited about it so i'm starting to work on it well i mean listen i'm excited now <laughs> i'm excited funny. i'm ready for i'm ready for hawk 13 the oh problem is i get to read these books so early that i have to wait so much longer than everybody else to find out what happens next ryan poor ryan <laughs> i know it's, it's rough man it's really rough uh but uh but this has been great ted i think we're going to take questions now and uh we'll all go out and grab Seahawk and look forward to the next one. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. That was amazing. I'm I'm back on screen now. Oh, good. Hi. Hi. Welcome back. Hi. Yes. Wow. That She's was back. great. She's back. She's back. I, I uh, yes. Oh, I thought Captain was going to come tonight. Oh, oh, oh. I told him. Totally next time. No, next you know time. What? We have a there. He has this most wonderful dog. Um, on top of everything else that you do wonderfully. He's, he's a great dog. Actually. He is a great yeah. dog. Yeah. Um, captain, my captain. He, he can come uh, anywhere, yeah. anytime. He can come anytime. He, he was supposed to, to come, books. Yes. but we were running a little late. Next time. And he next was time. out playing with the squirrels. Yes. So we had to get him going. As, as captains do. His squirrel. <laughs> Victoria calls him his squirrel friends. His squirrel friends. That's good. <laughs> um, well, he's, a, he's great. Hope he, that Captain comes. comes he'll come to, the next time. Comes next book or next time um, that you're here. So. Uh, we have several questions um, that have come in that I think are really interesting, and um, some of them are a little general. Some are very plot specific, which Good. I don't. I don't know. Um, we might even start with that. Uh, there's one that had, that. Do you anticipate Alexi's mother returning, or have Alex and son moved on? Um, she's returning. Oh. Yeah, she's escaped from the KGB camp in Siberia and she comes back to Bermuda and reunites with the family. So they're all together again. The whole family's together again. Okay. okay. Um I didn't know if you were gonna... no I thought it was about time for her to come back. Because yeah. I love that woman. She's fabulous. Yeah. So it's um she seems you have fans that want her back. I like her. Back. I want her back. So I want her back. Be, she'll be back. She will be yeah. back. In 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 the new book. She'll be back. In the new book. Warmongers. Warmongers. And that might not end up being the title, but that's the title right now. Uh, one of the things I love about your book is how you take us places, you know, that we're, mm -hmm. we really get to travel with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, do you have any ideas where you're going to go next? You're, you're, it's, you take us to very unexpected places. And I think right. um, Ryan already talked about that. But Right. No, I, I like to t uh, write about places I want to go. So I can go, you know, write it off. Oh. You know, it just happened in Bermuda. Oh, I'll go to Bermuda. 
Yeah, yeah. This is definitely where yeah. New York Times bestselling authors have it better than booksellers. <laughs> <laughs> we just get much. to read. We just better. get to read. Not that much better. Yeah. It's pretty great. Um, that is amazing. So uh, one more question about your writing process to go a little bit. So we know that you don't write, made it very clear that you don't outline no. and that you don't plan and that you write no. in the zone. Right. You uh, yeah, get in totally the zone. in the zone. Totally in the zone. And you basically kind of record a, the dialogue as it comes. Because you're really, really fantastic at dialogue. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I definitely, the, the, the dialogue is, in, I'm in the zone. I mean, I don't even know what's going on. You know, I sort of come out of it and go, oh, that was good. No, but actually there's passages where I get so involved being descriptive about atmosphere or character or some philosophical thing or something that I sort of zone out and just go with it, you know. But you know, most of the time I'm paying attention. So do you keep, uh, this is more the question that came in, which I was kind of, doing a little preamble to, but do you keep a, a spreadsheet? Do you keep a Hawk Bible? A do you, <laughs> do I, do you think I'm an very... investment banker? Do I, are you, am I on the right? <laughs> I listen, I agree, but the question came in, do you keep a spreadsheet? a spreadsheet? But I was thinking, do you keep, do you have these notes? Is anybody the keeper of, of Hawk's information so that you don't mess up? It's up here, it's oh, you, totally. you just know him Locked so well. Yes. You know your characters so and you don't. don't... Have to, yeah. Like you know your own birthday, Absolutely. so that you know your own case. Right. And... You know what's your daughter like? I don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, we, right. yeah. No, I know. How, you don't. You don't have I, a spreadsheet. I don't have a spreadsheet, my daughter. There you, know, you go. Okay. So you're you, either one. Yeah. So you do. So your character is lives in you and with you, and when you no, get in the true. zone, you write. Yeah, I know what he's going to say and how he's going to act before I even start. Yeah. So how much of you is in in this character? A lot. A lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and to jump in. Listen, knowing hockey, knowing Ted, a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah. No, it came from me. I mean, how much more can I be there, you know? Well, and I, I will tell you, I am, um, many of you, this book does not come out until tomorrow. So most of you, um, Ryan excluded, haven't seen this book yet. And, uh, but you start with a poem. The book begins with a poem by um, Tennyson. And uh, <clears throat> I was going to ask you to read it. I'll read it. Did you read it? Um, Absolutely. But it's one of the things that struck me most um, as, I, uh, as I read this book and got to know your character is how just it's how poignant that, that this is. This is a thriller and so i'm going to bring this back to my own emotional yeah, state right. but this is an emotionally evolved character right right he um alex alex is emotional. well all your characters I mean, are he's, but he's, he particularly is yeah he's, but he's emotionally involved. you had to he had to do, go somewhere from watching his parents murdered in front of his eyes mm -hmm. at age seven you know what how, how much more destructive and traumatic than anything in his life and so he's got to evolve um, so yeah, he's evolved. And he continues to evolve he does, yeah. through the stories. Yeah, he does. That's why I brought Alexi back. Because that was just a great way for him to take another step forward. Yeah, I love I I love their relationship and I love um I love how you show that. And if you would, would you um yeah. would you read this sure. poem? Well, when I read it for you yesterday, I started crying. But. <laughs> yes, but you don't have you said that you could do it without doing it. Yeah, well, I was I was trying to put a little emotional yeah. flavor to it. How can I do so I can see this? Let me see. Okay. Yeah, I can read this. Yes. My eyes are going. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a poem by Alfred Gore Tennyson. It's called The Voyage. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be that we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in the old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, and strong in will to strive, to see, to find, and not to yield. There you go. I'm the one who's crying this time. <laughs>
so that's, beautiful. That's a beautiful poem. That's a beautiful it's my, poem. It's my favorite. And so for any of you who are um, pure thriller fans, uh, which I know many, many of you are, um, these are thrillers. Your books are thrillers with depth and oh, um, so kind. And, and real beauty. Yeah, it's a real, you. it's it's very in, in the authenticity that comes no, so from the relationships. Fun. Did you want me to read a little passage from the book? Would you? Yeah, I, I picked yeah. one out. It's not action or anything, but it's, I just love it. You know, this is a favorite thing of mine to ask writers to, this is what you do best as you write. And uh, so to hear you read um, these words that you've written in a bookstore, it really is, to me, it's a reminder of why we, why we do this. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so how long can I go? I won't go longer than just this page, right? That sounds good, yeah. I mean, I don't wanna go on for an hour. I'm gonna read the entire book. Would you do that? <laughs> I saw this wonderful New Yorker uh, cartoon where they where there was a reading in a bookstore, and but he was reading silently to himself. <laughs> Everyone was just watching him read silently. Oh, read the New book. Yorker cartoon. Yeah, it's great. I love it. <laughs> I'll find it for you. It's great, yeah, I love it. Um, so so this is this is, this is Alex has just come home uh, from MI6 and. Uh, He's got a house in London in Mayfair and he's it's sleeting and raining and he just wants to be alone in this house. And it's a very, like the third, second page of the book. Um, it was so simple to sit here in the quietude of his book filled library before the crackling fire on this cold, windy and rainy night whilst nursing a smallish tumbler of Hague pinch whiskey. He sank down suddenly into his favorite chair a rather large red leather club chair, which Pelham had thoughtfully tucked in close to the hearth. It was well worn to the, part, to the point that it now fit him like a glove. The fragrances of numberless, very old leather bound books cheered him considerably. How he loved these quiet hours spent alone with his books. He had once been widely quoted in an article about men's libraries, Sunday Times lifestyle section as saying, quote, the gods do not deduct from the allotted span of men's lives the hours spent in reading. Also in the air tonight was the scent of spilled brandy from a distant century on the faded rose pink cushions of the Queen Anne sofa just inside the bay window that overlooked the lush now sodden back gardens. Other scent memories rushed in, sunrise camping at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro, lush vineyards on a hillside on the Isle of Madeira, a beloved parent with a mug of, with steam gently rising while he snuggled deep within the folds of his blanket. A fresh apple pie still warm, now cooling on the windowsill of some busy matron's kitchen in Kensington Mews. The early evening streets of Istanbul, the clouds of cherry blossoms bursting forth in full bloom in the Shinju Goyen Gardens in Tokyo. All these and countless more images and pungent olfactory sense memories cascading and never ending as the recollection of fragrances suddenly brought the whole world into focus and into him. There you go. <laughs> and that's not it. So uh, that's not the one you wanted to hear. No, <laughs> that was exactly no, that what it. I Look wanted it. to hear. That, that, I didn't write that. You didn't write that. No, that you, the zone wrote that. The zone, the zone wrote that. Wrote that. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I absolutely love. I love the language, and I love, I love all of it. And uh, so I'm going to um, end with. Um, gratitude for you writing these stories and for you being here oh, in the bookstore and you. sharing that with our little bookstore. Thrilled to be here. Thrilled, well, we are thrilled to have well, you. Well, it's a great little bookstore. It is a great little <laughs> bookstore and Charleston is a great place to, a great to come little and town, visit. It's a great little yeah. town. We don't need you to move here. We have yeah. plenty of Heaven people. on earth. Yeah, it is yeah. heaven on earth, but come visit, come <laughs> visit. And Ryan, you can move here. <laughs> Ryan, so you're allowed. You're yeah. allowed to move in. We're on the committee, by the way. We actually, we always want more good people. No, we so. screen, we screen the applicants who want to move. <laughs> <laughs> if you shop at the Blit I, I am there. I'm there for that and the next beach research trip, Ted. Oh yeah, the beach research. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking the Keys, or I'm thinking uh, I got to go to a beach. You got to go to the beach. I thought you I, didn't like sand. I told. I hate sand. <laughs> you hate sand. But I have put up with it for a beach. Okay. <laughs> no, I told you because I want to go somewhere alone and uh, and start and get this new book really going because I can't do it when all the people are coming in and out and captains barking. So I want to go, I'm going to go beach, beach hopping 
somewhere, you know, maybe it's Jamaica. I used to do all the ads for Jamaica and I, it's a beautiful, beautiful, have you been down there? It's incredibly beautiful. Uh, no, but I'm ready at a moment's notice. Uh, I know you want to be alone. If you mean alone a with suitcase. your best friend, Ryan, I'm ready to go, Ted. He's got a suitcase. I think he needs some company in Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> I read. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yes, and yes, and Ryan, come here when your uh, book comes out this August, and maybe we'll get, it's hard to get, August is a tough time in Charleston. Yeah, but let's have a party for us. We can have a party, and I think we have someone who might interview you next time. Okay, we'll turn the tables. And you have free lodging in my house. Well, I'm there, man. Let's do okay. it. And thank you for uh, for letting me be part of this. Ted, great to see you as always. Good to see you, man. Yes. And so please um, purchase this book. Write reviews. I always tell people to write reviews online in any of those big places that we don't mention. We but, don't say their name. But buy your books from independent booksellers. And uh, we would love it if you buy them from Buxton Books. Uh, Ted Bell keeps us supplied with signed books and signed book plates in case he's off on a on a beach um, somewhere or, or research or writing <laughs> um, we can we can and another thing to say and I mean I know that it's true so it's not a, it's a rhetorical question but these books um, can be read out of order you can read this book mm -hmm. without having read the other ones I came in with dragon fire yeah. and uh, and then have gone back they're, and so, they're, they're self-sustaining yeah yes. you don't have to read everything to read start in that's an important bookseller question people always ask that in a series yeah. if you can start you know they say well because i don't know who the characters are. i don't know what's yeah. happening well there's certain personalities that yeah. absolutely cannot start a series unless they start with number one yeah. there's certain I personalities i mean I'm, i think i understand that in some ways it's good it I mean, is good for, yeah. for like for hawk people say to me should i start with one and i say well i don't you can start anywhere you want but the, the scene that yeah forges hawk as a character is in that book so if you care about that, then you should start with number one. Yeah, but it's very interesting. It's almost like you go back like it's a prequel. Yeah, you know, prequel, so you, yeah. you you read it and then you go back and can get the backstory. But the books absolutely stand alone. I can say that um, with authority. Yes, you can. <laughs> and it's a good well, bookseller question. I'm the I'm a captain of this of this little ship. We always use a boat analogy. Every uh, looking at my booksellers laughing because I'm always talking about our our sailing ship, the boat. Okay. Like sometimes I call it a magic sailing ship. The magic ship. Um, which uh, brings me to say that you, the readers, uh, are um, really the magic that helps this whole ecosystem absolutely. work. Absolutely. Um, the writers the booksellers, but we couldn't do it without the readers and the people purchasing the books. This is how publishers decide when they want to hear new stories Absolutely. from from favorite authors yeah. and how we find new voices yeah. and how yeah. we get to do what we do. And it's really as simple as um, thinking before you click. And if you can, um, shop small, um, shop local, come in and say hello. But most independent bookstores, including ours, you can also pick up the phone and call us. You'll get a real human. And uh, and we we love that, but you can also shop just by clicking a link. Um, we're so modern that way now, and we will ship anywhere. And we just are so grateful for each and every reader and each and every person and the magic that makes all of this happen. And most of all tonight, we're thankful for you Thank and you. for Seahawk that comes out tomorrow night, Thank tomorrow you. day morning. I think you can buy this on shelves just about anywhere, especially independent booksellers. So, thank you, Paul. Thank you. It lovely. Yes, it's so wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, each of you, for choosing to spend your evening with us tonight. Pack your bags, buddy. We're going. I'll see ya. <laughs> Down Bahama. What was you that song? Kiyama. You got it, <laughs> you got it man. I'm end, ready. We could end on a song. We could end on a song. <laughs> we could end on a song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure, man. Take care. Have a good evening. Merry Christmas. Happy Pub Day. Happy, Happy Pub, Day, Pub Day to everybody.